Hello and welcome to this episode of the Common Babbler. Uh, here we deep dive into a series of conversation about pedagogy in undergraduate classroom. I am Kalyan Chakravarti. I'm an associate professor of biological science and chemistry at Korea University in the School of Interurban Arts and Sciences. And my guest today is Professor Shiva Kumar Srinivasan, or Shiva, as he is popularly known. He is the professor of physics and also the dean of research at Korea University. Professor Shiva Kumar uh, has research interest in quantum optics. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist. Uh, Professor Shiva Kumar obtained his PhD from IIT Madras in 99, and uh, he has been part of the Department of Atomic Energy Laboratory at Kalpakkam, the Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, part of both Reactor Physics Division and the Material Science Group. And welcome to the Common Babbler. Thank you. Thank you, Kalyan. It's a pleasure to have you here. I know that your, your schedule is extremely busy. Shiva, may I ask that what's your hobby? How do you... I, I don't think you get much free time, but if you do... Yes, I do read a lot. Um, I do a lot of Tamil literature. I read all genres, historical novels, fiction, science fiction, and so on and so forth. Something that I cultivated right from my school days. Mm. So I do. Of course, I also like um, uh, driving. So okay. I like long drives, So which I definitely do. And of course, solitary walking is another one that I like. Walking alone. So. Okay. Any particular era of Tamil literature that is your favorite? So, usually novels, uh, stories, fictions written post-1930s. Okay. Yeah. One of the things um, that I wanted to ask you is that you had been the um, designer of the course, uh, I think it's called Scientific Reasoning. And for a little bit of context... Uh, I think in the university curriculum, the first year, there are a set of common courses, foundational courses, which are for all students, whether they later want to specialize in history or in physics. And then I think the thinking was that scientific reasoning should be in the bucket of common courses in the first year, right? And uh, it must have been challenging, I mean, to teach scientific reasoning to, uh, for example, a history student. And sometimes I think there are some students, and unfortunately that is probably because of the school experience, that sometimes they are intimidated by science. Right. So why do you think that, uh, what was the thinking that scientific reasoning is essential? Why, why scientific reasoning? Giving some background for these courses, I think you are referring to core and skills courses that we teach here. Expectation is none of these courses is really a prerequisite for anything else that students will do. It essentially tells you that these courses are absolutely essential for all students, irrespective of what they are going to specialize later. So the first uh, set of courses that we uh, framed at that time had these 11 courses. Uh, these courses themselves were actually suggested by the governing council at that time. Scientific reasoning, if you ask me, is essentially a course on reasoning. The adjective scientific is there because uh, for strange reasons, these things are practiced quite explicitly in the sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and therefore it has become scientific reasoning. Otherwise, it's a reasoning course that everyone needs. And uh, that boils down to asking the question, what is reasoning? So in a simplistic sense, if you want an answer, a reasoning is the process of arriving at a conclusion on inferring something from a set of facts. If you take this perspective, then it is obvious that this is what everyone does, whether it is history, biology, chemistry, politics. So you have a bunch of facts in front of you and you have to arrive at some conclusion or verify whether a conclusion is obvious from the set of conclusions. So this is the process of science, reasoning. And therefore, it was felt that scientific reasoning could be one course which every student should know. Compared to what conventional logicians would do, scientific reasoning involves few other modes of reasoning um, which may not fit into the definition of mathematical rigor, but it will help us actually to advance science. I mean, in this context, biology, physics, chemistry. 
So suppose uh, to come back to the question that suppose if a history major is taking it, what would they take away f- with them from that course that that maybe they can uh, apply to history uh, immediately? Maybe I, in this uh, conversation, probably I will stick to my definition of uh, reasoning. So given a set of facts, can I make an inference or a conclusion from that? So historians or students of history definitely need this aspect in their study. So it could be wars that happened over a period of time. And it, what is really important is not in which year these wars happened, but rather why these wars happened. So that's a question and we need to arrive at an answer. So now what is it that is available to us from that time? The facts. It could be archaeological fact. It could be literature based facts. From that, can we infer something about why these wars happened? So how would a history student arrive at these conclusions? So unless the person has a methodology to arrive at these conclusions, there is no point in even collecting this information, archaeological or literature based. So that's why this reasoning course becomes important. It could even be, for instance, using uh, fossilized uh, objects to uh, say something about what might have happened at that time. All these things will come under this category. I must add that uh, the the course that you design, of course, I'm part of it and part of the instructors. And I know that the course has a certain structure. So how did you structure the course? What was the thinking behind it? Actually, um, we can distill something that is independent of any discipline. So that forms the core of this uh, course. This is essentially what we call logical arguments. How do we construct an argument? Um, a related question, of course, is should we teach it at all? So, for instance, most of us would not have had this kind of a course in our college education. But now we seem to be claiming that we can teach this course. So the answer to that question is as actually we learn it without actually knowing that we are learning it. So we have learned this process of uh, logical reasoning without somebody actually telling us. Now that we know enough about how to arrive at a conclusion based on uh, available facts, it is possible to teach students how to do that actually. So what is the first thing we should teach them is actually the structure of how to construct an argument, how to arrive at a conclusion. So that's what we call logic very often. And in that there are various modes of reasoning, deductive, inductive, abductive, and of course the later statistical reasoning which in my opinion is not really different from deductive reasoning. Um, I will explain it if there is an opportunity why statistical reasoning is deductive reasoning. So once we teach uh, these modes of reasoning and tell students what is the structure they should be able to figure out uh, to identify what mode of reasoning is used or what mode of reasoning they would like to use, then you throw examples at them. First explain to them with complete details as to how uh, an inference is arrived at, then give them additional examples to think about. So that's how you train them. So see, this is a course which should be practiced day by day so that it becomes part of your thinking. It is like learning cycling. In the initial days, you would know where the pedals are, where the cycle bell is. But after a few months, it becomes automatic for you. You don't really struggle to know those things. So we have to ensure that the students practice enough of these techniques that these become part of their thinking so that they don't have to take a deliberate efforts to actually use them. I mean, so the way that uh, the material is arranged, uh, there is sort of like a skill, intrinsic skill to the, uh, to the whole reasoning process, I would say that, Initially, I think uh, one of the argument is that some of the reasoning is universal. Like, what is deductive reasoning? What is inductive reasoning? And uh, then it's kind of, I think, uh, comes to the planetary scale or the cosmic scale where the motion of planets and the whole Copernican revolution is discussed. And after that, in the art scale of, I think, continental drift, uh, which is discussed. And I think we finally, uh, I mean, uh, one of the material, I don't know if that is final, is about uh, periodic table, 
where the essential ideas of atoms uh, is discussed. So there is a scale intrinsic to this, probably in between huge jumps of scale. The purpose of these examples is to actually tell them that this methodology is applicable at all levels, okay? whether you do planetary science or dive deep into the atom, these reasoning methods are the same. Okay. And in fact, we also have examples from uh, medicine. We had examples from history. Basically, to tell you these, these are applicable to those domains as well. So, in fact, I would not hesitate to say this adjective scientific is actually <laughs> doing injustice to this. Because uh, science is scientific, definitely true. But everything scientific is not necessarily science. For instance, I can have some kind of a scientific approach to a problem in history or politics, which may not involve anything of what we call science. That process is still scientific. Uh, so scientific in that sense is uh, global. It in subsumes science as a part. So scientific reasoning is not necessarily uh, reasoning in science. It's not reasoning this. everywhere. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, that adjective, uh, I think, is basically because it was scientists who practiced it very explicitly and too very often. Okay. That is the reason it picked up that adjective. One of the definitions that you said that uh, it's reasoning based upon facts. Would you say that deductive reasoning is reasoning based upon premises or axioms? Yeah, I use facts in the sense you are given a set of statements which are stated to be true or valid, I would say. I won't even use the phrase true, valid. And then deductive reasoning he arrives at a conclusion which is definitely valid, provided the initial statements are valid. That's what it is. What is truth is a deeper question. Um, but... Uh, this much we can definitely say. So deductive reasoning gives you results which are certain provided the axioms or pre presumptions or answers are valid. That is slightly different in the inductive case because in inductive reasoning there is no formal way of arriving at the conclusion based on the premises. Simple example would be, let us say, people come to bank, they all pay 10 rupees for some charity purpose. Now, yet another customer is coming into the bank. Now, claiming that this customer will also pay money to the charity is an inductive reasoning because the person may actually go out of the bank without paying anything to this. So, um, that is inductive reasoning. So, inductive reasoning can actually lead to results which may not be uh, true or valid. Whereas, in deductive reasoning, it is always true. So, you cannot uh, go wrong in your... Uh, conclusion, provided, of course, the initial assumptions are valid. So inductive reasoning, though it is not a mathematically justifiable uh, way of thinking, it's very, very essential for the natural sciences. In fact, uh, post facto, almost all uh, creative ideas in science, you can actually trace back to some kind of inductive reasoning. So if I understood correctly that the process of formulating the theory is initially inductive reasoning while looking at a pattern and then formulating the theory. Once the theory is there, based upon that predicting the behavior of a model in future, that can be a deductive reasoning because assuming the theory to be true. Yes, that is perfectly right. Um, we, as I told you, we form models or theories based on a, you know, a finite set of observations. Uh, yes, a good example for of this could be actually a contribution from Newton. He probably looked at planets around going around the sun, probably moon going around the earth and the apple story of him seeing an apple falling from the tree and suddenly he realized gravity. But by making this finite set of observations, now he claims that this is the way everything in the universe operates. So that is inductive reasoning. Uh, is it uh, something that is derivable from this finite number of observations? Definitely not. But then how do I say that it can be a law? 
it's only provisional. Any time Newton's law can be proven to be wrong. It's a possibility. So far, we have not come across uh, that kind of a, a, a deviation. So we believe it is true. So this is the problem with inductive reasoning. So the result that you get may not hold forever. You mentioned about statistical reasoning yeah. and the statistical reasoning is more of the deductive nature. Yeah. I mean, I was just wondering that it kind of sounds to me that it's more inductive in nature because we are looking at possibly a correlation that two things are connected or uh, they have uh, correlated behavior. So probably one can predict the other, the sort of thing we do with inductive reasoning. There is a possibility of failure in the sense that uh, in a statistical reasoning, we assign only probabilities. Okay. At, but the way we arrive at that result is totally deductive. So the deduction itself is for probabilities. And in that sense, it's actually a deductive reasoning. Okay. So that's why I said uh, I wouldn't be willing to call that as a very new form of uh, inference. Uh, but the quantities that I'm dealing with are probabilities. One of the way that, uh, I mean, I often think that the, the models in fields like physics and chemistry might be different from something like biology is, of course, we expect the physics and chemistry laws to be valid throughout the universe. So there's an universality aspect to it. I don't know if theory of evolution would be valid in if there was life in in another planetary system. Would we would we expect the same kind of theory of evolution to run there? And does that change the nature of the laws? Like in one sense, the physics and chemistry are uh, the laws. Once they are formed, then probably calculating is one can say deductive reasoning yes while in biology we have reason inductively that the the evolution worked and give us this diverse life forms but if we find life elsewhere uh, will the theory of evolution work there or what? To, how to think about it? So I think you brought it a very valid point. Mm. Our laboratory has been mostly Earth, in and around the Earth, maybe solar system. And so we have made uh, observations on a finite part of the universe. And based on this, we have arrived at laws. And there is no necessity that these laws should be valid all through, over all times, not just in space, even in time. Um, but we also want some kind of simplicity in what we predict, project as laws. Otherwise, it is too very complicated. Uh, of course, simplicity itself is a very subjective notion, I understand. Uh, so if another life form in another planet need not be even carbon-based, that's a possibility. So, but... Uh, Will the loss of physics change? No, I believe that it will still be Schrodinger equation or its extension that will operate. It may not be carbon-based life. That's a possibility. Uh, it may not but, have the kind of shape that we have as a possibility. But it's still within the periodic table. Exactly. So it cannot go outside the periodic the, table. That's the belief. In fact, this assumption that uh, all carbon atoms, for instance, are identical is what we call uniformity assumption. And so I believe that Wherever they are, these atoms have the same behavior. If you question that, of course, there is no way we can answer this question. But if you think these atoms behave the way they are, they behave on Earth, the same way they behave elsewhere, then, of course, we can think of possibility of life elsewhere as well. Um, evolution, uh, is it something that we can uh, see it emerging from the... Uh, fundamental laws of physics. Uh, it's a very complicated system, biological systems are. But we do have uh, uh, quite a few examples, mostly uh, computer experiment based, where simple rules can actually give rise to very complicated structures. Uh, so that uh, such studies, I would say, they indicate the possibility of a complex structure evolving from 
very simple rules. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't be surprised if you actually find that life actually has a very simple explanation. Right, right. One of the beautiful example in scientific reasoning is, in fact, I don't know if it's uh, it's it's outside natural sciences, which is I, I think in today it can be called public health, and I think uh, it was particularly relevant after the COVID pandemic, which was looking at the London cholera in 1854, and um, how it was found out that the patients were all based on the water line which was connecting their homes right yeah. so one of the interesting theory and uh, so while I, was, while I was reading the material is that uh, there was a prevailing theory at that time that the disease spreads by smell or like a gas and uh, that could be an inductive reasoning at that time. I mean, now, of course, we know better. But if one thinks now in context of COVID, the COVID indeed spreads in a similar way. It's not quite smell. It's yeah. not gas. I mean, of course, these are the viral particles that people are sneezing or coughing. But it, it was a valid inductive reasoning. I think that also had... Um doctors, as you pointed out, patients from different parts of the city, but only people from particular localities were actually suffering. So obviously, uh, there is a correlation if you want to use the language of uh, statistics. Okay. Then you ask the question that uh, is something, whether something there is actually the reason for um, this uh, uh, problem. And that's a natural thing to do. Okay. So, is it inductive reasoning? I actually I would uh, even think it is more like abductive reasoning, which I haven't spoken about. So, the abductive reasoning is a fairly recent uh, form of reasoning. I mean, uh, uh, remember, these are not deductive. In some sense, deductive reasoning is the only reasoning. <laughs> the rest are all uh, trying to actually uh, infer something from what is available to us. So, abductive reasoning has a very simple structure. Suppose there is a cause A and it produces an effect B. And um, this is what I know. There is a cause A which produces effect B. There could be other uh, causes as well, which I don't know about. What I observe is actually that effect B. Therefore, I say cause A must have happened. Okay. So let us say I am walking on the road and the road is wet. Therefore, I... One possible way to infer is it must have rained. Okay, so it's an objective reasoning. Why? It's also possible maybe a leaky water tank was going on the road. Therefore, the road got wet. Uh, so, in some sense, I could even put it in uh, objective reasoning format, saying that if there was contamination in the pipelines, then this uh, infection is automatic. I see infection. And therefore, possibly there was contamination. So, uh, except for deductive reasoning in other places, there is a possibility of actually using different modes of reasoning. There is some mild ambiguity because they are not very rigid forms of uh, reasoning, not uh, rigorous forms of reasoning. From students' perspective, so let's say that if the students put the scientific reasoning course to use, in other courses that they are taking, or even in the future, what they will do, or in in terms of coursework, uh, how do you see that they can they can use this uh, skill, or uh, if I might call that the reasoning skill, to uh, for example, other courses or in future, or even currently they are doing. As reasonable people, we should be able to reason. <laughs> so, as, so, as I told you, these are all methods for uh, uh, reasoning. So, let us say even in a lecture in uh, politics or economics, uh, when teachers present facts or, you know, make certain set assumptions and then arrive at something, and that's a very deductive, logical way they will try to do. But very often in social sciences, there could be competing uh, theories which 
would be used to arrive at very different conclusions. So how these computing theories came about? It's because people thought different ways of connecting those facts and arriving at something. If it is deductive, there is only one way you can do. And uh, so if you want to really um, understand in a broader perspective, um, I would actually think that students should practice in every uh, learning that they do these uh, uh, methods. Like it could be deductive, abductive, inductive, doesn't matter. They should practice. And uh, what is it that they gain by doing this? First of all, it helps them to formulate questions, uh, refine them. And then uh, if they think with the information shared with them by their instructor, they are unable to arrive at an answer, then actually they can go to the instructor and ask what it is. So this will strengthen their learning in the first place. And uh, once you know how to learn, I think you will never stop learning. And whether it is 10 years, 20 years, doesn't matter. You will always be a great learner and you will enrich yourself and of course uh, you will enrich others as well. Uh, I'm also sure it has very practical uh, uses in the sense uh, if you want to do your exams well, uh, though that is only one of the minor aims of education, it helps actually to use methods of reasoning as you learn. Uh, so I would say it it is important for students to have this when they are in, be it UG or PG, to do well in their courses. And therefore, there's a practical use to this as well. You mentioned 10 years. So suppose after 10 years, I mean, of course, it's possible that the students will not remember anything uh, from that course. But if they do, like, what, will it still be useful in professional life beyond learning? Uh, let me put it this way. Can we actually spend, let us say, un until we are sleeping somewhere, an hour without actually doing some kind of reasoning. It could be going to, you know, coffee pantry. It could be deciding which shop to go and what to eat. You actually reason moment by moment. There is no moment where you don't reason unless you are sleeping, okay? This actually tells you a very, very efficient way of doing the reasoning, okay? So if you do not have enough facts, you know that you don't have enough facts. You will be either doing inductive reasoning or abductive reasoning. And you know the pitfalls. So you are mentally ready, okay, what I predict could go wrong because I don't have all facts in my hand. So I think uh, 10 years, 20 years, whether they remember this course or not, uh, whether they pursue later, actually what they pursue in Korea, they may not pursue, they may do economics now and do something else later, but they cannot uh, run away from reasoning. It could be investment in uh, share market, <laughs> or it could be floating a new uh, uh, venture. Everywhere they need to oh, know some kind of reasoning. Since, since you mentioned this, I just thought that of this question that is it a, always a rational reasoning or it can be irrational reasoning, but it's still reasoning. For me, reasoning, there is uh, nothing uh, irrational about it. It can right. only be rational reasoning. Remember, rational or irrational are essentially defined by uh, the kind of facts that are available to you. Um, so, for instance, uh, nowadays, if you ask, majority of people will say astrology is irrational. Fine. Let us say some 500, 600 years back when these kind of sophisticated technologies were not available, if somebody was able to predict majority of major events in life and it all happened to be so, then people will think there is some truth in it. Okay? Because people didn't have all facts available to them. So, but now we know so many other things. We have much... Uh, detailed ways of uh, studying this and therefore we can actually dismiss it as not really uh, scientific in the sense that we use the phrase scientific. Uh, so that's what, remember Aristotle uh, when he formulated uh, uh, the behavior of bodies he said uh, uh, smoke goes up because that's where it belongs and the stones fall down because that they belong to earth. It was an attempt to give some kind of reasoning exactly. in the very limited information that is available. So, post facto, they will all appear irrational. Right. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, very interesting conversation. And it was a pleasure to have you here. Thanks again. It was and wonderful, Kalyan, uh, opportunity to tell about this course. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you for being with us in this episode of The Common Babbler.
and we look forward to have you in the next episode also thank you